Our methods, details, and strategies can improve anyone on earth at any level and in any application. That might be a lofty claim unless you're this week's guest, Greg Walsh. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I'm your host, Scott Volkortson. This week's guest is Greg Walsh. Greg has used his diverse past to forge his own path in business. He is the founder of the Wolf Brigade Gym in Rochester, New York, and he's one of the most genuine men you'll ever meet. I was so fortunate to be in the audience at Summer Strong when he gave one of the best presentations of the weekend. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Greg. How are you doing? And thank you so much for that. I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm excellent. Uh, I lo- I'm looking forward to this one. I've been looking forward to it since Summer Strong when you agreed that you would do this. <laughs> <laughs> the, and on that note, the one thing that I had as I started diving into like doing some research on you is just how many different levels there are to you. But I found this quote on your website that I think is a good way to lead in and give our audience kind of a basis of who you are. Is, and it's when you say there are many valuable paths to many incredible places, but this one is ours and yours. The price of admission is the price of admission, and the only tax is the cost of commitment. <laughs> I've read that many times since I first came across that. Where did was that something that you came up with? Yeah, man, you 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 caught me a little bit off guard because because although it goes under the radar, that is one of my favorite things I've ever written. Um, and, and a lot of times, you know, we we seem like we're into one thing, but realistically, it's just been such a large accumulation. If you take any pieces out of the puzzle, this wouldn't be anything like what it is. I, I know that a lot of times, what people know us for is is very technical and detailed and brutal effective training but that that didn't just grow on a training tree so a lot of times when i'm trying to i don't know if it's explain or justify to myself or something how we've gotten where we are it's an amalgamation of of 35 years of just you know uh counterculture and and a little bit of unusual path and, and things like that so the fact that you picked that it's a it's a great it's a great lead in and and i've been looking forward to this since we met at winter strong expecting that at some point it would happen <laughs> <laughs> well i appreciate it because you know we were just talking off camera how busy you've been since you got back so i appreciate you taking the time to do this man and anytime so you kind of touched on it there that your background is probably not the most conventional path and maybe even more so like the conventional path into, you know, owning a gym, you know, I, at least not the way I see it. So let's kind of dive into the, you know, your background a little bit. I know it ranges from BMX, MMA, martial arts, you know, you were into hardcore music. I think you even played if I understand correctly. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and those those were all equally important pieces of the puzzle as I as I see it. And any of those unconventional paths, if if you're invested in them in as more than just a participant. I mean, when when I was a very young boy, I, I started booking shows here in the city, so there wasn't a lot of people doing that, and I had no business doing it. I was <laughs> I was a, I was essentially a child, and you know we we just we just kind of looked at it and said okay it's happening in other cities. It's these young kids doing this stuff and, and we either do it or it doesn't happen. And, and so we, so we did it and man, you learn, you know, you, you, you learn, you learn the positives, you learn the negatives, but you learn them. And, and BMX was, was the very same at the time. None of those things were user friendly and, and, and certainly not community friendly. Um, you want to get ostracized in a weird suburb, uh, get into BMX bike riding and hardcore music as a kid. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it when I look back, but at the same time too, you know, you, you, you develop, um, I don't know, an, an intuitiveness that you wouldn't have developed on a conventional path. And so for, for all the downsides and insecurities it's given me and, and scars and bumps and, and, you know, I would imagine like some level of mental illness, you, you, you are preparing yourself for the hardest things to come, whether you know it or not. And, you know, I sit around and think about that kind of stuff a lot. The the gym has been a, has been a, a, a geez, it's been a tremendous honor to work on, but it has not been easy for one single minute. And 
part of it is because it's a tiny, you know, I, I guess uh, boutique style gym is the wrong phrasing, but the correct <laughs> connotation. Um, it, 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 there's, a, there's a barrier to entry and it's exactly what you said. It's, it's quality and commitment and, and integrity and things like that. But that's not a growth model when it comes to when it comes to fitness. So we, 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 we chose the harder path because that's just always what what we've been attracted to. Well, and even that, like when you start getting into like booking shows and stuff, how does that start? Because it's not like back then we had the Internet that you could see what other people were doing, you know, across the country or in different areas. You know, <laughs> so we're, we're I, actually I, feel like making... that's a pretty, I feel like that's a pretty big endeavor, you know, to take on booking shows and doing that at such a young age. That's a, that's a fun question too. Um, we're actually, we're finally making some new shirts and they'll, they'll be out very soon. One of them, one of them just says analog on the back and the picture is just a broken in half uh, vinyl record. And then it has a couple of other little scrawled things on there, but you, you're hundred percent right. I mean, it was, it was pre-internet completely. Um, I'm not going to totally date myself, but it was quite a long time ago. And it, it was, flyers at shows in other cities you know you didn't really book in your city unless you were traipsing around finding out what exactly was happening elsewhere because that's how you met the bands that's how you learned the protocols that's how you figure out like how to deal with the sketchy stuff that that quite literally at that point always happened at hardcore um it was it was not a docile user-friendly environment um so so when i started booking that stuff there, there was any there was any level of of I don't know, dysfunction to it. We, we would have to make up stories to rent different halls and things like that. And then you'd have to rent sound gear. And, and as a kid, no credit card. You, you had to have cash to put down as a deposit. You had to trust that the place was going to give you your cash back. You had to trust that the, you know, either motorcycle club or people that you were working with at the time who were supposed to be there for security were actually going to do that. Um, it, it was a real cash in hand type business. And and I was a kid, man. I mean, like when I say I was a kid, I think the first show I booked was 14 or 15 years old and my parents don't have money. I didn't have money. Um, so there was there was there was a lot of conventional and unconventional risk there. Um, but, but when it came off, man, it, it, it worked. <laughs> and I, I assume being that young did like that people would probably try to take advantage of you. Like you, <laughs> you mentioned getting your money back or security showing up on time. Yeah. <laughs> Constantly. <laughs> um, a, a couple of the funnier ones. Uh, we, we booked one show here that was quite large. Um, in order to get people to come in, we put that it was like a benefit for the environment or something. And, and um, uh, the show itself was very, very well attended. The bands on it were great. Um, but there was a lot of polarizing bands on there. So, I mean, there were fights outside before we started. Uh, there were other people who were who were communicating with me about like coming up to, to beat up this person or this person and all this kind of stuff. And so at some point, too, you're cashing in favors, you know look, this band has to play later. So if you're going to punch him, just punch him once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and luckily people listened to me, but that particular day, um, I think one window got broken and, and it was really innocuous. No one was trying to be reckless. The, the, the counterpoint to some of the stuff I've said is, th is that the groups that would attend those things were extremely appreciative and, and really, really cared about their scenes and their bands and their friends and things like that. So the bad elements were people that would come to cause trouble with the good elements. And so that was, that was always something that we struggled with is, is you had to know that, that what were going to come and cause trouble were troublemakers and then, and, you know, not to be weird, but like they had to be dealt with or, or it would have just, you know, continued to grow and, and it becomes a cancer in a, in a scene like that. So you had to be prepared to, to, to do what had to happen to keep the scene the way it needed to be. So were you involved like with martial arts and stuff prior to that, or did this kind um, of stem from there? Well, you know, just wanting and, to become more capable. And and just just quickly because it might be funny, is is the end the end to that show was the guy that owned the club coming back and asking for twice the money he had asked for the show that day. You know, and they would say it was four hundred. He he came back, said, Well, there's a lot of kids here, you know, I want eight hundred. At the time, we're in the basement of this club, and he's a goth type of dude, you know, with big, big, big dark hair and, and all this kind of stuff. And he's got this spiked glove on, 
and we're in the, we're in the <laughs> basement of the club and I'm, you know, maybe 16 at this point or something like that. And, um, he's got this spike glove on and I'm standing there and, and he's kind of, you know, got me in this corner and he's saying, I want, you know, I want this money and all this kind of stuff. And I'm saying, look, man, I got $400. But I got 400 people upstairs, and if I come upstairs with holes in me, we're going to destroy your place. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, he conceded, and, and we, you know, we paid 400, and it was a great show, and people still talk about it to this day. But, um, you know, I mean, if I would have been a huge pushover, I, I would have given up all our money. And, and the two things that happened then is you end up having to explain to a terrifying band <laughs> that you can't pay them. <laughs> Or you lose four hundred dollars yourself, or, or or something else like that. Um, and then to your other great question, no, um, mar- martial arts was later. Um, but all of this, all of this was was precursor to. You know, I, I I've I've always been an anti bully, but I've always gotten into physical trouble. And you know, eventually I started realizing that even though we were we were pretty we were pretty smart about it, and and based on necessity, we were pretty strategic about it. There had to be more than that. Um, and then, you know, in 1999, I started training in martial arts and then I started training good martial arts in like early two thousands. <laughs> and then the, then the rest, the rest is history from there. So where did that resolve come from as like a 16 year old? Is that something you learned from like your parents or just out of survival mechanism? Uh, honestly, my, my, my parents are excellent, um, but I, I'm not really sure that we could be more philosophically different. You know, <laughs> I, I took I took very very strong things from them: um, work ethic, detail orientation. Uh, I think would be the two biggest ones. Uh, my dad is extremely hard worker, extremely detail oriented, and an excellent and effective communicator. And and you know, one one of the things that he put on me when I was young that stuck. And, and honestly, it's the only reason that anything I've ever written about those times in my life is accurate and didn't end up some fishtail is that he would always say, take contemporaneous notes. And at the time, <laughs> I had no idea what <laughs> contemporaneous meant. It didn't matter. But, but what he was trying to get at is when something happened that was interesting, you write it down somewhere. And so since the beginning of the beginning, I always just had little pads of paper with me and I would always just take little notes down and, and, you know, put these, put these either thoughts or details or something in place, maybe not knowing that one day I would, I would chronicle them, but just knowing that there had to be some type of, there had to be some type of paper trail there. Um, and do you and have, then as far, sorry, well, say, do you ever defer back to those notes? Just like, oh. as like a learning so process with, with, with um with a lot of writing that I've done and, and writing that I'm continuing to do, a lot of times they're the main mover. You know, you you guys know exactly well that if you see something from a certain time, it can bring you to a fully detailed piece of that time that your mind itself never would have brought you to. So the, the so the notes the notes have been so valuable and, and still something that I do a lot. I mean, I've I've got I've got just you know harder looking books and things like that of, of all this kind of stuff. But if I needed to reference them, then, they're, then they're there for me. That's interesting because my mom does that. She's, you know, just turned 70 last year, but she's still to this day, she has notes of like, she'll take notes from every single day. <laughs> wow. You know, this happened or Jeez. this happened or, you know, and, and it's interesting because that time, you know, there's times that we'll go back and we're like, Hey, you know, what exactly happened there? And she'll pull out a notebook and she's like, well, this is what I wrote down. (laughs) Wow. Which is pretty interesting. I mean, and, and I, I have a really strong feeling towards that. You know, I mean, I, I can look back and, and there's, I mean, I have not to mystify it, but like I have papers that there's like blood smears on. I have papers that like are clearly weathered from something that I have no idea what it was maybe being in the sun. But I do know that there was, you know, the, the period between maybe like 1993 and, and 1999 was, was, uh, was a lot, <laughs> um, uh, an awful lot happened in that time. And, and although I can reflect on some of it as good now, there was, there was, there was an awful lot of deal breakers in there. And, and a lot of times writing them down and, and, you know, keeping them a little bit organized in my mind, I, I, I think kept me from, from somewhere worse. Well, I'd imagine like, that all that you did through this had to prepare you even unknowing at the time for the, you know, the business world. 
un- unconventional business world. I, 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 my, my greatest shortcoming as a business person is being a business person. Um, we've, we've, we've always had, um, marketable ideas. We've always been true to what we said. We've always made quality first and profit a distant second or third, which is, 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 as you well know, isn't always the right choice. I've made that, I've made that choice way too often. And so, the shortcoming we've always had has been logistics, business logistics. You know, we, we've had we've had some tremendous projects. The ones that have been the most successful and fallen the hardest, um, I take partial credit for. But we've also been derailed an awful lot intentionally by others, and and that that's been challenging. Uh, it's it's just kind of shown the fallibility of of how I've built certain things, and and you know, the the old timey handshake agreement is is no longer what it what it was, and. And I was just going to say, you, you come across as a guy that if you give your word to somebody, that's your bond. Yeah. And I would expect that you expected that from other people. Is that what maybe where that came from that? Yeah. And, and, you know, and also I think maybe either them being able to sense that and me sensing that and them changing course or, or something, but if, if, if I commit something to someone, I will never fuck them. And, and, you know, even to go and say that, you know, many years ago, uh, we have, we had a small brand called hell on earth. And for a while, uh, we, we make clothes. That was, that was what the production company was called. So, so for a long time, we booked shows under the name, you know, hell on earth productions or whatever. And, um, in, in addition to shows with that, we, we ran extremely successful, extremely wild BMX bike contests. And those just felt like really big, crazy shows. So we started making shirts to sell at these things and all this kind of stuff. And, and then the Hell and Earth project turned into, we wanted to help others from other countries that we liked. We tried to distribute some brands over here um, that made soft goods. And that's another time I got really caught with my pants down. Is At that point, I was very good at importing hard goods. We'd already had some quite a bit of BMX uh, um, parts and accessories experience. But I had never imported soft goods. And so what we learned fast is that there's a million different duties and taxes and uh, total BS that I was not privy to. And we ended up upside down like crazy with that stuff. And 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 just to just to speak to to where my mind is as, as far as integrity and, and where my word is, is um, the way that I look at it, I still owe two people from England some some money. And, and as soon as things go the way that I want them to go, um, they will, they will get that fucking money. But, uh, that, 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 that's one way that, that's one way that we have gotten cut short is, is I've shaken hands with people that, that on paper and in the public eye, people would think are very trustworthy and they're just simply not. And, and that's, that's a, that's a bitter pill I've, I've eaten way too many times. And it's, I'd imagine that's something that's hard to get past when you have a certain mindset that if I give you my word, this is what I'm going to do that. I mean, I, 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 I try and look at it as allowing me to appreciate others that actually hold that up as opposed to just really keeping this high level animosity towards those that haven't. If, 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 if I, if I would allow myself to stay angry at the people that have that have taken advantage of us and impacted my health and sanity and, and financial stability and, and all this kind of stuff, I would be I would be angry all the time. And that's that's that that's something to me that's it, it's it's price versus cost. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to forget that those happen. And you know, even even somewhat recently, I mean, uh, uh, people ask people ask a question on a talk or someone asks a question personally or on the internet or something. I'm going to give an accurate answer to that question. I'm not going to, I'm not going to water it down, um, but I'm not going to bring it up, you know? And I think that's what was so interesting about your presentation at summer strong is you could tell it was 100% you and from the heart, you know, it wasn't, you know, it's not like there was any question that that's who you are and what you've experienced. So a question I had, I know what, we've talked that you do a lot of training like with law enforcement. So two questions on that. One, when you were 15, 16 years old in that lifestyle, did you ever think that you'd be training law enforcement? (laughs) And secondly, to that point, I've heard you say that you get a lot of negative feedback 
or pushback that you're training law enforcement, which to me is completely asinine, but I'll defer to you on that. What, what is your take? Yeah, you're you're good at this, man. Um, So one, yeah, you know, I think I may have even said this in somewhat a clumsy way in a a post at one point. But if if the 15 or 16 or 17 year old me knew that part of what I'd be getting paid for at this point was, you know, making better cops, (laughs) I I probably would have punched myself right in the face, you know. Um, And, and, you know, we, we, we were never we were never bad kids in the sense that we were, you know, burning people's cars and breaking into homes or anything like that. But, but BMX was, was some outlaw stuff at the time you got chased. I mean, we, I've, I've ridden my bike in downtown Rochester 10,000 times. And from, from 1990 to 1999, I probably got chased by the cops 500 times downtown. You, you, you just kind of just, that, that's just what happens. You know, <laughs> you're, you're doing what you want to do and, and they don't want you to do it. And, and that's, that's how the relationship works. Um, Kind of, I guess. Um, but when, when I got to California and started training uh, at, at my gym, I always call it my gym, but the place that I found that was just the perfect fit for me is, you know, early, early days CrossFit uh, martial arts in, in the form of, of Muay Thai, grappling, uh, Sayak, uh, some Savat. They were just really well-rounded, excellent thinkers. They, they just wanted to be better at martial practice. And it was perfect. You know, they, they immediately introduced me to firearms. They immediately introduced me to weapons. And they immediately painted with the brush that anything that can harm you is a martial art. And, you know, yeah, maybe you can kick and punch and all this kind of stuff. But what if someone wants to wrestle? Well, maybe someone wants to fight you with a knife. Maybe someone is maybe someone is at risk and, and you need to take a different course. And, and as a kid that had that had had to use unconventional means that really resonated with me. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've always carried things around in my pockets and, and I've never looked for excuses to use them, but if there was a reason to use them and I was a skinny, unprepared kid and the option was either get hurt or my friends get hurt, then that's it. That's it. There's, there's nothing else to think about. So the idea of being more skilled and disciplined in those regards was, was my just, a, a, it was felt like I was being given a gift, you know? So the fact that a lot of those people were martial were martial artists, but were also cops and, and military, was a real big paradigm shift for me. And what I learned quickly is that, just like with everything, there's going to be ones that are there for the right reasons, and there's going to be ones that are there for the wrong reasons. And what we had to do then, and what I'm what I'm better at now, is the barrier to entry. If, if we get lazy wannabe cops that want to come in and stand around and, and, you know, LARP their way through training so that they can say they train at Wolf Brigade, they get weeded the fuck out. And the reason that that happens is because it takes an entire group to make a place, but it only takes one bad egg, one bad egg to ruin a place. And so from a, from a law enforcement standpoint, I, I, I'm... I'm, I'm never going to be one that says, like, I love law enforcement. But what I do respect supremely are those in that field that want to excel and protect. And that's, that's what we make. That's what we help. Uh, that's what we market to. And when I say market to, our product is our process. And so when we see, you know, um, someone doing really well, we, we will often say, okay, you're shifting the paradigm. People are going to notice. You're welcome to tell them what you're doing. Great. If they're interested, great. If they're not, then great. But the flip side of that too is in, you know, this, this is, this is never meant to just cast aspersions, but we've had more cops short pay us quit early. I mean, we're easy to deal with in the logistical phase. We don't contract people uh, but we don't take anybody for less than three months when they start training at Wolf Brigade because you can't get anywhere in 30 days with anything that's real. You're still shaking dust off from all the dumb stuff you've been doing. And, you know, w- when it comes down to it, we overinvest and uh, very, very much under return with with law enforcement. But I, I won't I won't change how we do it because we've also made some of the finest law enforcement that Rochester has ever seen. And one of the things that you're very skilled at, I think it's because of your attention to detail it's just overall like movement patterns with people that have been, you know, injured or banged up. And I think, you know, like 
former military is obviously at the top of that list of people that have a lot of injuries and don't think they can move well again. And has that always been something, a path that you wanted to go down from like where you got banged up with the BMX stuff or how did you get like into, because your methods are definitely unconventional from what I see, you know, what we see online. Yeah. Um, and, but before I ahead. answer that, the one thing I noticed too is in, in talking to you, you've always said that you don't have to have a prior skill level to come train with you. That's right. Which I think is pretty neat when, you know, so many trainers want to just work with those people that have been doing this for five or 10 years or have some sort of baseline. They're not willing to start at ground zero with them. Yeah. To, to the, to the last point you made first, um, putting 1% on the 99% is the easiest, the most profitable and looks the fanciest on the internet. But really it's low hanging fruit. When, when you get a natural athlete and, and most of the fight organizations out there are proof of this, when you get a natural athlete that's ready to kick ass and wants to excel in their craft, they will find ways to improve even amidst totally idiotic training. <laughs> because most of what we see professional fighters doing is totally idiotic. And so for, for us and, and my, my first goal, the fir- you know, the, fir- the first the first person that I was ever tasked with training in the early 2000s uh, was this really cool guy in, in, in Long Beach. And he had a really crazy skin condition where he had to kind of wear this sauna suit thing almost all the time. He's, he's a little bit heavier set guy. And, and so it created some movement restriction. It created, you know, th- this really kind of premature panic response because his, his body temperature was really out of whack and all this kind of stuff. So really from Jump Street, I had to figure, OK, I want to train anybody. This guy wants to make progress. I'm going to figure out how to squeeze that out of him because realistically, what am I doing here? You know what I mean? I, I, I knew that I wasn't going to be an immediate pick uh, to train these high level fancy athlete types because they're just going to look at someone like me and wonder what I'm up to. And so I, I knew I was going to have to I knew I was going to have to pave that road the hard way. And the other the other point that you made is excellent, too. The reason that I've, I think, been able to develop so many intelligent adaptations that work within all the primary patterns and improve all the primary lifts and things like that is, is because I've been banged up a lot. And a lot of the conventional strength strategies, especially the ones that were being used at the time in early days, CrossFit and things like that, didn't, wouldn't work for me. Um, a, a barbell front rack is usually the example I go to first. My, my right wrist has been broken twice. And um, the one time it was broken, I got asked to go on an extremely high profile BMX trip and <laughs> took the cast off and went on the trip. And and. If I hadn't have gone on the trip, would not have gotten my job in California, would not have found my gym, and a, a, a good argument could be made that we would not be having this conversation. Um, so it was, it was a risk reward, but what it made, uh, what it made um, is the necessity for adaptations for the primary pattern. Like I couldn't rack a barbell. So that's when we started tinkering with how to get heavier kettlebells into the front rack. Because I, I understood that, that okay, at the time, if the universal standard for a kettlebell for a man was 44 or 53 pounds, that wasn't sufficient for, for the scheme. Everything would have to be scheme appropriate. If, if, the, if the set said five or seven and the, the intended tool was a barbell at 100 and whatever pounds, seven didn't make sense at 53 pounds. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to figure that math out. So, so for me, I had to make I had to make things work that kept me in the pattern of training that I wanted to. And what that ended up letting me do is is it was the beginning stages of being able to help anyone that walked in the door by by addressing each tool as both diagnostic, developmental, and recovery. So that's that's kind of that's kind of the door that that opened. And for those that are listening that don't know, you've been very instrumental and one of the innovators of all the different ways to use like the mace. Is that where this kind of came from or how did that evolution come about? You know, because you see it on Instagram a lot now and I've talked to different people that have incorporated that and they said it's absolutely invaluable to 
their just their movement patterns, their overall shoulder health, everything. It 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 really is a it really is a super unique Swiss Army knife, and and we're not we're not um, we don't have implement bias. If if something got us where the mace got, that would be the tool. But what it happens to be is is the mace, the kettlebell, and the barbell when combined, in our experience and in our proof, makes in, incredibly durable, incredibly strong. Uh, people of any of any skill level, the the, the kettlebells uh, were appealing to me because they would they would help me deal with some of my physical abnormalities and bang ups and things like that. And then the mace was appealing to me one from an aesthetic point of view. I, I was I was a wrestler and martial artist, so I, I knew that it was just a storied tool of strength. It was it was almost like a mythical object, you know. And so when I started seeing someone out in Southern California doing stuff with that. I hunted them down and, and we worked together. And then, um, you know, he, he, he came up with the ball on the end of a stick, um, did that for a while. And then when the market cooled off, um, and, and they couldn't make them anymore, uh, I, I picked up the ball and ran with it. There was, there wasn't any, this is a broad brush, but I can say it with some confidence. There was very, very little, if any detail oriented mace training out there before I made it. And people were swinging maces and they were swinging them heavy. And the ones who were swinging them well were swinging them well and have been for a long time. But as far as standards, implementation, varied uses, it was very limited. And I started realizing quickly that, that the leverage and all that other stuff that the mace can offer that nothing else really can were just these huge unsung values. And so then, you know, we really started developing that. And I feel like what you did with it is you were able to, you know, the people that were swinging it, I think early on were people that were already in phenomenal shape or didn't have nagging injuries or whatever it might be where you took it, where, you know, whether it's somebody that's never trained before somebody that's rehabbing injuries and were able to like build that foundation from the ground up that would get them, you know, to a level like those other people. Yeah, I mean, we've 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 really landed some crazy stuff with it. I mean, when people have you know internal rotator injuries in the shoulder and things like that, which which happens a lot with fighting and BMX and all that kind of stuff, the handle of the mace and the leverage enables people to press while that injury is recovering and still develop all the musculature around it while not actually aggravating the injury itself. The very same can be said with people who are recuperating a squat. You hold that mace out in front and tip it forward a little bit. Even the very, very lightest one, even a sledgehammer, is something that we use a lot for that. And it creates this really perfect circuit where people are able to rebuild stuff that's been broken down. Um, it makes a tremendous accessory at the end of heavier days and things like that. And it, it's 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 just it's just purpose driven strategy that no one had really dug deep enough to find. Um, I know we've talked about it. I one, of the, I have to get into that more, you know, I've done it a little bit and I've watched a lot of your videos, but it's definitely something I want to get into more just in, especially in talking to people down at Summer Strong, how it's helped them and benefited them. You know, mutual friend of ours, like Brandon swears by it. Uh, Bo Sandoval is, yeah. you know, you always see his videos and he's incorporated into his training that he does with people. So it's something I definitely want to get into. Um, but like we, you know, we talked about off camera, we could talk training and get into the weeds yeah, of that all yeah. day long. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, you know, ever since I knew we were going to do this, I, I started having like all these different topics that I wanted to get your thoughts on because you have such a unique perspective and insight to them. And the other thing that it seems is you are a very thoughtful person when you answer. You don't just say the first thing that comes to mind. It's a very calculated reply, which is not necessarily the norm right now in society. It's a matter of, it, uh, it'll lead into one of the first things I want to ask you is I've heard you say that right now we live in a society of he who yells the loudest goes the furthest is how we think. Mm -hmm. So what, what exactly do you mean by that? Is that like, you know, the more extreme we can make our position, the more we think it's going to get us more likes or more notoriety. Sure. I mean, and, and that's that that's been true even long before the internet. But it, it just it seems to become so prevalent now, where 
it, it really is all just kind of, it's kind of veiled behind a persona online. And if, if someone is either, in my opinion, questioning the merit of their position, if someone is maybe not sure, but knows they have to say something because their audience is barking for it. A lot of times I think what people do is just go with the reckless, loud, flagrant, and they know that it's going to buy them something because the other thing I've seen, and I don't enjoy it all, and I try and stay, I try and stay as clear of it as I possibly can, is the addiction to attention is what causes people to say most of what they say, not a conviction towards what they're saying. And I, I understand that. I mean, if, if you have a follower base that is rabid and is going to push the button and wave the hand and send a, what do they call it, emoji, you know, to, yeah. to anything you say – there's like a false validation that comes from that. But if, if that's what you're built on now, you have to keep refueling that tank. And it doesn't happen by being calibrated and quiet and meticulous and patient. It doesn't. It happens by throwing the bomb in the street, standing there and watching it go off and then blaming someone else for it going off. And I, I just, I've just never really been that way. And along those same lines, you know, you talk about like, people aren't necessarily convicted about what they're, you know, discussing brings up another line that I've heard with you is you talk about like so many people are so quick to say what they're anti, but we don't ever find out what people are for, what they're passionate about. Yeah, that's a tough one. And I've, 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 I've taken, I've taken leads on that concept from some really smart folks. And, and, and that, that, mindset adjustment was an important one. It's really easy to just hate everything right now. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in, in, we see it in our industry where, you know, they want to villainize the a rifle or a pistol or whatever it might be, or they're anti this and they're anti that. And many times they don't even know what they're talking about. They've heard somebody else say it. And then if you ever sit down with them and you try to talk to them about a sensible, you know, like a solution or, you know, different things, they're not even interested, you know, it's like foreign to them. Well, and I think, I mean, this, this is a larger societal issue, but I think people care a lot more about being heard than being right. And so a lot of times people aren't going to have framework behind a position. They're not going to have a foundation for the house they're building because they just really simply don't care. And, and a lot of times right now, they don't really need to. That's crazy, <laughs> but but I, I think it's really true. And and just to circle it back to training for a second, and I've mentioned this too. I understand why a lot of the old timers and, and a lot of the really really strong folks, when they first saw mace stuff and kettlebell stuff come out, relegated it as a gimmick, because a lot of the education and demonstration was was poor, me mediocre at best, and, and really did come across with kind of a gimmick feel to it. So I, I knew that we were going to have an uphill battle. Um, but I, and I think it's an industry that has so many gimmick things that come and go, so many fads. Yep. That when it's something different than what they've always done or what they're uncomfortable with, all of a sudden it's easier to dismiss it than it is to learn about it. Yeah, we, we, we've, we've always been big on proof. And, and, you know, that's the one, that's the one thing I think has been my favorite about the internet is, is really that, although I don't do as much of it as we should. And, and, and part of that was we got out of the habit of it when everybody was locked down because it was just, you know, we, we weren't trying to, we weren't trying to beat a drum that was going to get us, you know, targeted. But w when, when we, when we are able to show what our people are doing, the, the merit of the detail orientation, the merit of the overall strategy and concept becomes so clear so quickly. I mean, they, they, they move great. They're clearly thinking about what they're doing. There's clearly a purpose behind what they're doing. And I, I think that one of my favorite things is that that translates into most of their outside training lives also. And that, that's, that's, of course, the point. You know, I mean, we, 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 we love strength and conditioning. We love, we love practicing all kinds of physical culture, but the goal is to just make better humans. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, if you're great in the gym and you're kind to your training partners and attentive and, and work hard and are gritty, but you go out in the world and you're a piece of shit, well, we failed. And, and that's, that's, um, I, that's kind of a, that's kind of a tall order, but, but that's, that's how we do it. I mean, we can't control what happens remotely, but e even the people that follow us rapidly 
uh, that we've never met and things like that, you do really get a sense for the fact that they're, they're, they're just something a little bit different. And, and, and we really, really appreciate that. That's, that never goes unnoticed, especially in this, especially in this world right now. Well, and, you know, especially like over the last couple of years where everything's been so chaotic, the, I think the level of critical thinking, you know, people are so quick to go with what they hear or what they see, you know, we could, this is a whole nother rabbit hole we could go down, but, you know, obviously if you're on social media, you're seeing so much of just what the people that agree with you see or are saying. So you don't have those different views. And I think people have lost that ability to, you know, think through a thing through themselves. And circling back to training, I think that's what's, you know, when somebody can improve themselves physically, I think it transcends into their mental state and so many other things, you know, and during the last two years when people have been, you know, separated, locked up, I think that leads to a lot of the problems we're seeing now. How did you handle like your training being in New York where I assume the restrictions were much? Yeah. Quickly to your other point, I, I, to steal from movies, truth is a virus right now. But, but the thing is when you catch it, and you understand what it's for, it actually becomes something you want to keep. And, and that's, that's what we found too. And, and during that, during that two years, I mean, we're still clearly not through it, but during that two years where things were just the absolute craziest, the amount of messages that we got saying that, that the way that we think about things and the way that we've articulated things has helped keep people above water is, is serious. That's serious business. I mean, we, we took that, we took that extremely seriously and, and, and something that I had to learn the hard way myself is you, you had to start not really trusting anything that you saw just digitally. There, 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 ha there had to be proof in a non-digital form in some way because even we got tricked sometimes. I would see something that you could vet, you know, three degrees down and it still seemed truthful. And then I would hear back from someone else, no, that's bullshit. And it was really just a, it was just really a, a big scheme and a scam to get that type of person to believe. So, so you, you really did have to kind of set your spam filter to the absolute highest level. And it, it made us smarter. It made, it made me a better thinker. Um, but it certainly wasn't easy. And then with New York, um, yeah, so we do what's right now, what we're told. And uh, if they happen to align, great. If they don't align, then I don't need to think any further about it. And one thing that I knew I was not going to do is take strength and sanity away from people when they needed it the most in their entire lives. So we were smart. We were private. Uh, we were courteous. And we did what was right and not what we're told. And subsequently, we're still in business. All of our people are still alive. Everyone is doing well. And it's just another reason that you learn to never trust the government. And I think, you know, I think back to, you know, you being a 15 year old kid, you know, having to learn all the ropes and figure everything out. How much of that set you up for, you know, navigating through like these difficult times? All of it. And, and, and it's, it's an, and that's an excellent line to draw. You know, even, even when I got more into the BMX side of things from a, from a, a business standpoint, seems really strange to say business and BMX in the same <laughs> word, but, but all, all of those lumps that we took insulate you for lumps that are going to come no matter what project you're in. I mean, if, if you're doing something that isn't franchising a subway restaurant, you are going to get knocked around. And, you know, now, I mean, we, we, we get knocked around in, in the last two or three years. I mean, we, <laughs> I, I joke about it, but it wasn't funny at all. I mean, we helped usher in cancel culture, you know, um, <laughs> and, and any, anyone that was anyone that was doing anything hard minded and independent that didn't look like a Lululemon ad got targeted by all these goofballs in such significant ways and, and, and they're good at it. So, so, so some of the bumps, nothing can prepare you for, but it, it does help you. It does help you keep the ability to pivot when they, when they do come on you, you know? And it, it's something we've talked about. The frustrating part too, is we can be limited in what, how much of our message can get out, whether it's our industry or, you know, some of the messaging that you do where it seems like, the groups that want to attack you or 
cancel you don't have to deal with those same restrictions. None of it. And and we even learned, you know, the hard way that that, geez, a lot of the servers that they run off and things like that are these like protected things in other countries that are just veiled behind 300 layers of cybersecurity. And I mean, it's it's in a way it's impressive, uh, but it's just impressive in, in all the wrong cultural ways right now. You know, the, the, the people that are the safest are the ones that are the most reckless and the most harmful. That and it, sucks. You know, and they can they can sit behind a keyboard. You know, it's not like a younger you, you know, dealing with a bar owner that has a studded glove on ready to, Yeah. you know, there, there's no repercussions for these guys to say what they say. N- none. And that's such, 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 it sets such a dangerous precedent. And, and, and really all you can do is, is, I don't know, just be the best person you can and, and know that, you know, <laughs> less all the time, but hopefully still true is that the truth comes out. So there's two things I thought about. You were talking there about like the BMX. One is my kids are probably, if they listen to this, they're going to have to Google what BMX is probably. (laughs) I, you know, growing up, I, I know exactly what it is, but I never even thought about that. There's probably a younger generation that's not even sure what that is. And then secondly, you know, you mentioned earlier that you knew like with who you were, or maybe the look that you have, you weren't going to get a certain clientele. Do you think the opposite of that is true, though, that you've brought in a certain clientele or given hope to people to find fitness, you know, with who you are and what your background is versus the, you know, the former quarterback turned gym owner type individual? Absolutely true. And the, 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 the nice balance there is that because we're good at what we do and, and we're kind, welcoming people, we have we always just refer to them as nice, normal people, but most of what we, most of what we train is just nice, normal people. And, and they're brutal and they're detailed and they move as well as anyone in the world. But most of them are, are really just awesome people that are living very, very conventional lives, not professional fitness type folks or anything like that. Um, and are just hardworking and dedicated and, and, and ready to be more than, than, you know, they were told they could be or, or whatever the case may be. Um, the other thing to your point, which is a hundred percent accurate is, is we've gotten, we've gotten a lot of response and a lot of buy-in from, from people in these, in these weird corners of counterculture, you know, I mean, both, both hardcore music and, and BMX for the most part, never really had a component of, of training hardcore more. So, I mean, when I was a kid, there were a small handful of guys that were either boxers uh, there was one, 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 someone who I'm actually friends with now, who was, who was a Muay Thai fighter when, when I was very young in the hardcore scene. And I always looked at that and I was like, that makes sense, you know? <laughs> and now, I, now I can see that we, we've been reaching those types of people. They, they know that physical culture is a part of that other culture. They just maybe either didn't fit in or didn't want to go to a regular gym or, or, you know, the, the, the certain types of trainers or coaches didn't resonate with them because they were just unrelatable. I mean, if, 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 you know, if, if you, if you came out of the womb with a 300 pound bench press and a 450 pound squat, you're not going to appeal to someone that's been riding your kid's bike around in the streets at night, you know? And, and, but, but it's just as important for them, if not more. So we have been able to cross those lines. And, and I've, I've always really said that my, my, my ultimate goals are to help improve, uh, strength and conditioning within martial arts and action sports. And, and we're, we're at least, we're at least on the way, you know, it's it, tough nuts to crack, but we'll get there. <laughs> well, there's another quote that I found on your website. I think that sums that up. It says we routine, routinely rebuild the broken and cultivate empower and improve many normal people to near mythical degrees. I, I, I stand by that hundred yeah. percent, which is, you know, like you said, it's heading to the gym can be a very intimidating place. I've said that a million times. And, you know, I think it's important to have somebody that is relatable or that you can see that they're doing what possibly you want to do versus the stereotype that is like, at least I think it's getting better now, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the stereotype that was the quote unquote gym rat. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the lines are blurring and, and as they should, because there's value to both sides. I mean, the, 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 the idea and we get relegated to this because most of what we show is is kettlebell and, and mace stuff because everybody shows barbell stuff. And the kettlebell and mace stuff is what we've tinkered with the most. And I think I touched on this at, at 
at Soranex is is a lot of the primary barbell lifts outside of just nuanced positioning that sometimes slips through the cracks. We don't need to tinker with that because people for hundreds of years have have put that down and it's amazing. So so we always basically just say thank you. That's something we don't have to dissect. And we lift we lift barbells all the time. We lift them well. We lift them heavy. And that's that's the that's the three that's the three headed serpent. You know the, the the maces, the kettlebells, and the barbells. When you put them together with with a with a cohesive process, it just it makes those it makes those mythical creatures, man. <laughs> I'm telling you. And well, and, and I've heard you talk about it, like on other podcasts. If you pres- program something like a 30 second hold, it's 30 seconds. It's not you're dropping down at 28 or 29. Yeah. Yep. You know, and is that just like you mentioned before to build that culture in the gym that. that that's know. right. Well, I mean, integrity is integrity is integrity. If, if, if 30 seconds when you're tired is 24 seconds, well, that's going to be 24 seconds somewhere else too. And for, for us, we, we scale to people's ability. Uh, we're not a torture chamber. Uh, we're extremely strategic and accurate. And so it gives people confidence that when we put something on the board, that is a completable task. And if there's 15 people in the room and there's six different skill and fitness levels within that 15, they can all do it because that's what we do. That's what we've built it for. And part of that is the language. You know, we we use language like scaled to ability. We use language like up to, scheme appropriate things like that. So it's it, it's not that there's ever an excuse for a different sort of performance, but the priority isn't always the weight and is very seldom, if ever, exclusively the weight. It's position, it's composure, you know, it, it's it's the things that are the tangibles that, that take away to anything but training. That's a great way to look at it. And, and, and we have, and we have to, and, and a, a lot of that w- with me was, was, okay, I know I want to do more. I've got this injury. How do I do more with doing less better? And th- that's really been just the, the catalyst for how we've done almost everything is, is this, is this concept of minimum effective dose and then using these handful of implements and, and really, really accurate, you know, well vetted body weight stuff to get people there and, and it, it works. So I have to imagine that for a certain demographic that you work with, having something different than just like the three main lifts, you know, doing the mace work, the kettlebells under your instruction keeps it fun and interesting to them. You know, and I to count or to piggyback on that, I would also imagine that as they start to feel better and have more movement because of like let's say the mace work or whatever it might be, that then they they can enjoy those bigger lifts more because you, you, they're not dealing with a shoulder right. injury or a bad knee. Well, we, we've 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 used the main lifts and we use them all the time. We use them well, and the reality is we we consider just the main lift um, essentially almost a piece of a process. It, it 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 it's only the process if that's the point. So if you're competing in powerlifting or something like that, of course, there's value to accessorizing other things. But your goal is going to be to do that lift extremely well and extremely heavy. And so you have to tinker way back on the accessory stuff to keep the primary process, the the lift that you're performing for competition. For people that are just trying to be generalists, there's a ton of value to lifting really, really heavy. But if you're just lifting in a linear pattern with one particular implement, I mean, we, we kind of consider that, a, you know, a hole in the boat. There's there's going to be an entire world around you that, that you're missing a little piece of. And, and that's where we like to fill in the, in the blanks. And people that have lifted really, really heavy for a long time that start doing some of this other stuff, geez, they, they really do benefit a lot. And, and, and one, of my, one, of my favorite, one of my favorite people and then one of my favorite uh, participants in our process right now is Derek Woodski. Who is, who's just, I mean, from, from, a, from a physical side and also from a philosophical side, someone that I'm just a super big fan of. And he's been able to really improve some longstanding challenges with a handful of, of different ideas from us over just a short amount of months. And we've proven that many, many times, but it's really, really nice to see it 
remotely, and it's really, really nice to see it on someone with that much experience. And and Brandon is Brandon is right in that same category. I mean, these guys who have just had these legendary physical careers that were often relegated to kind of one particular thing or one particular way, being able to open some new doors is, is it's like it, it's just it's phenomenal. It's such a perfect extension of well, what we're doing. And I think we see it a little bit. Uh, did you have the opportunity to meet Bill Gillespie down there? Yeah, yeah. You know, he's a guy who has yeah. done incredible, you know, world record setting incredible. bench press. Incredible. But then when you sit there and talk to him, you realize the price he's paid with his body, you know, not being able to move his arm above his head. Yes. You know, and all the different yes. things. And now at, I think, 62 or 63 years old, he's going through that process of, I need to get my movement back. I need to get my health back. Yep. You know, which... And it's 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 really we you know uh, another term we use a lot is just lighting the corners, and when when you're when you're hyper focused on a goal, I mean whether it's physical, whether it's business wise, whether it's just a life goal, it's really easy to let other things fall to the wayside, and and I understand that. I mean I've I've had good conversations with people lately about the, the kind of the fallacy of balance when you really have a a, a purpose. If, if if you're really a purpose driven person it's really hard to conceive of, of a true balance. I know that I haven't found one yet and, and, and I'm not sure I will. Um, but, but with physical stuff, I believe that not finding one is, is a real detriment if, if what you want to be is just a generally brutal, healthy human being. Uh, because really one, one, one ingredient does not make a soup. Exactly. And, you know, speaking of balance, I've heard people say it's impossible to be balanced. You have to be intentional with what you're doing, because it, it's never going to be a perfect balance of, you know, 33% family, 33% career, <laughs> you know, it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think so. No, I mean, I, and I'm also, I, I, I will admit to not having tried as hard as I should to strike that balance. And that's on purpose also. And the reality is I, I knew that for this to go where it needed to go with some of our unconventional challenges and, and I guess with, with maybe my pretty lofty goals for it, it was going to be a deep dive. And <laughs> I admittedly thought that we would be further sooner, but things take the time they take. And now that different eyes are getting on it and responding well and things like that it, it it shows me that that it was time well spent that the tinkering is worthwhile because and I've said this I've said this many times and I believe it I'm, I'm not an egotistical person but I believe I can improve anyone walking the earth and that's the same of the trainers that you saw down at, at, at summer strong that's the same of, of the people that, that work at our place here in New York that there's a there's a there's a detail orientation to it that's that's very, very different. I mean, I've, I've been in, I've been in strength conditioning arenas for, for 20 something years now. And I've never, I've never, I've never seen people who are able to address others the ways that we do. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. That's, that's, that's our, that's our goal, you know? And I'll, and I'll circle back to a guy like Derek Woodsky that you brought up, you know, somebody that's been around the strength and conditioning thing has, you know, he's been an athlete all his life, you know, so, I think when you get a guy like that, that starts to sing your praises and tell people what it's doing for him, you know, that's going to trickle out into a much bigger audience with a lot more credibility coming from a guy of his pedigree. Well, I, I mean, what, <laughs> if you take he and Brandon, the, the, the bullshit meter on those two is, is a nearly impeccable. So if, if, if I were selling snake oil or, or if, if we were turning a dial that didn't need to be turned or something like that, one, I think they would have told me. And two, I know it certainly wouldn't have improved them because, because neither of that is a small task. And, and that really does just trickle down to so many other people that we've helped. I mean, we've, we've, we've sharpened up things that, that people thought were permanent dysfunctions or limitations with a couple of sentences on the internet at certain times. Or a, a 30 second video that I can film with my own phone right in the gym and then send it to someone and, and, and things like that. And it's just because we've done it intentionally for 20 something years. And, and you know, I, for, for, all the, for all the mania of it, uh, for all the possibly 
uh, obsessiveness of the detail, it, it really has allowed us to, to pretty much help anyone that needs it. And I would think, you know, the monetary side of things, put a, you know, put those aside for a second, seeing somebody that thought they had an injury they were never going to work through or work through a movement that they haven't been able to do in 15 or 20 years has to give you like a tremendous amount of just pride that all the hard work, all that attention to detail, regardless of the setbacks and the times you've been burned and all those different things has been all completely worth it. I would imagine. It, it's awesome. And and it does feel like that. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not so inherently positive that I can say that that's its own full satisfaction. I mean, at, at some point, that has to translate into me being able to to help the people here the way I need to in in real ways, in financial ways, things like that. It, it really does need to translate into me, you know, living a little bit less of this lemonade stand type of lifestyle. And and I've I've always I've always just I'm just a sim, I'm a simple person, you know. I mean, I like I like nice things, but I don't like a lot of things, you know. I mean, I. I I have nice furniture that I've been collecting for many, many years. Um, I really enjoy firearms. I, I really enjoy, you know, certain other things, but I don't have expensive tastes and I don't have an expensive lifestyle. And I don't think I ever will because I don't care. Um, but what I do care about is the fact that at this point, all of that stuff has to come to fruition where I can provide for those that are, that are helping me build and, and run this thing. And I know that you can relate to that. And it, it's, it's all part of the evolutionary process. Um, and I guess, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's in a big emotional or not emotional, but, and I don't even want to call it a burden, but it does weigh on you when you start to have people that, you know, you're paying them a salary or a paycheck and you know that their livelihood depends on some of the decisions you make or don't make for that matter. I'll, I'll fully put it on emotional. I mean, I, 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 I don't even like I don't even like the notion of, of, I mean, yeah, I, I'm strange about that stuff, man. Like if I have $2 and you need $1, I have $1. And, and the fact that that's not how we've been able to run this business yet is, is it's, it's, it's heavy for me. I don't like it. Um, and, and so I, I knew that I knew the price versus cost with, with being small in an intentional way was going to be this way. Um, but now, you know, the next steps are the next steps. And, and now it's just got to, now it's just got to be a little bit different. Um, but th the way that I've also always thought about it is, is when you have something that's proof based, when you have something that's integrity based, that you have no intention of ever stopping, the money becomes the easy part. And, you know, you know, I'm never trying to cry pauper and I'm certainly not complaining about anything like that. We are far better off than many, many, many people right now. I, I never lose that in the shuffle. Um, but, but smart people are always going to find money. And, and now I just have to smarten up on the, on the logistical and, and bureaucratic side of things, uh, because we've got, the, we've got the training side of things, uh, well handled. Greg, this has been awesome. I have really appreciate yeah. it, but, but I have and one, I have one more sharp. question. And this is one that I ask, I'd like to ask almost all of our guests, but I'm probably looking forward to asking you this more than anybody else, just giving the way you answer things. And it's, I always feel like everybody has what I call like a pivot point in their life, which when it happened, they, it may have been good or bad at the time, it may have been the worst thing that ever happened to them at the time. But as we get older, we always can draw back to that one experience or that one event as kind of the catalyst, you know, in some cases, I think it sent people down a downward spiral, but eventually if they can learn from it, you know, can you, with all of your background and all the different things, do you have like one event that you can think I, of? I was, I was wondering if this was, if this was going to be the closer, <laughs> um, uh, per, personally or professionally or, or both or either, either or. So I'll answer it quickly and I'll answer it in two parts. Professionally, it was, it was going on that BMX trip where I had to put myself in some, in some physical risk. Um, there's a company called props that is, um, they, they, they documented BMX riding, you know, they, they made these video magazines at the time when VHS and then DVD were still like a real thing. And they would do these video magazines quarterly and, and people would buy them and all this kind of stuff. And, and what that turned into is it would take riders put them on an entertainer's bus, drive around the country and film it like it was a reality show. 
um, and they called it Road Fools. And um, I got invited on the second uh, iteration of Road Fools. And it was a gigantic drive. I drove from New York to Chicago to meet them. And then we drove out west and, and did all this filming and all this kind of stuff. A bunch of people got hurt. I was hurt when I got on the trip. But it, it opened every door that I walked through and it got it got me where I it got me where I was. Um, I, I ended up getting offered a really great job running a bike company in California, which is which is where I found the right training for me and expanded into my own avenues and, and things like that. So from a professional standpoint, if I would have said, hey, my wrist is broken, I'm not going on this trip. Um, I would still be a kid in New York running a, a, a small bike company, maybe. And, and nobody would have blamed you that if you would have said, hey, I can't go, my wrist is broken. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I would have. I would have. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, 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 per, personal, personally, the answer is there was some there was some pretty negative stuff that happened when I was young. Um, um, I, I got I got I got assaulted uh, when I was a kid um, and that changed my perspective on everything. Um, you know, you, 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 you're involved in these underground cultures. You're doing this weird stuff. You feel like there's a bit of infallibility to that because you're just this different kind of reckless, whatever. And then something happens and, and you're, you're ass out, you've got your ass kicked and you're laying in the street and then you gotta, you gotta figure that out. And, um, it, it, it puts you right where you need to be. Uh, it, it, inst it instills and installs a, a humility in you that I'm not sure too much else would. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm never out of my lane and, and, you know, people give us, people give us shit when I speak confidently, but I don't speak confidently until I can prove it on anybody walking the earth. And, and part of that is because I know what the lowest feels like. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't need to lie and fabricate things in order to prove a point. Um, cause I can prove it in, in reality anytime anyone wants to see it. Well, and I think when you gave your presentation at summer strong, us in the crowd, that's, we could actually feel that from you. That's which, such, that's such a tremendous which, compliment, man. I have, I have one other thing that I overheard at summer strong that I'm going to got to, I just got to tell you this and we'll close with this. Thank you. We were standing in a group and for those that don't know, summer strong has some of the biggest, strongest people in the country there. You know, guy squatting 855, you know, terrifying. Duncan did that yeah. pulling 835. So and somebody looked and you walked by and they said, of all the people here, there's the toughest guy that's in here. And then what he said, though, he goes, but the really neat thing is he's also probably the nicest guy that's down here. And I thought that was like a perfect way to sum up who you are. Just from that, you know. And, and you did nothing more that simply walked by. We were standing by over by the uh, where the food was being served, and you walked by, and that's when that came up. And that, that, that's far too kind. That, that's that's hard to hear. That that's amazing. Well, Thank you. You've earned it, and I've I've enjoyed getting to know you, and I hopefully get to spend a lot more time with you in the future. Thank you. This and, has been a real pleasure. Thank you oh, so much. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. If you want to learn more about what Greg has going on, you can follow him on Instagram at Wolf Brigade Gym or online at wolfbrigade.com. If you have any questions or suggestions for us, hit us up at podcast at Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hope you enjoy, everybody. Thank you.